All right, so I just want to thank you all for being here and encouraging me, and I really appreciate the opportunity to share with you all what God's laid on my heart and what his word says. So um, Thomas Watson said, Till sin be bitter, Christ will not be sweet. So until as Christians we learn to hate sin and learn what sin really is, we can never fully understand or enjoy who Christ is and what he's done because we still love the things that once ruled over us. So that's what I'm going to try to do tonight. I'm going to try to paint a picture going to different Bible verses of how wicked and evil sin is, but yet how good Christ is. Um, so first off, we need to define what is sin. What are we talking about when we say sin? And I don't think I can say it any better than John Piper. Uh, it's kind of a long quote. And I know you're not supposed to look down at a paper when you're doing, uh, when you're speaking, but just show me a little grace right here. Um, <laughs> So John Piper says, what is sin? It is the glory of God not honored, the holiness of God not reverenced, the greatness of God not admired, the power of God not praised, the truth of God not sought, the wisdom of God not esteemed, the beauty of God not treasured, the goodness of God not savored, the faithfulness of God not trusted, the commandments of God not obeyed, the justice of God not respected, the wrath of God not feared, the grace of God not cherished, the presence of God not prized, the person of God not loved. That is what sin is. Uh, or simpler for me, any transgression against God or his law. That is what sin is. So who sins? Is only Hitler a sinner? Is only someone who does something really evil? Is that who is a sinner? Or what does the Bible say about who's a sinner? Does it say anything about that? So turn with me, if y'all would, to Romans 3.23. Alright, so Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. And it's funny, when you do a word, like when you look at the word in Greek language, the word all means all. So it's not, um, it doesn't distinguish. Everyone in here is a sinner and has sinned and falls short of the glory of God. Everyone in America has sinned. Everyone in the world has sinned. So it paints with a broad brush. It doesn't excuse anybody. It doesn't um, let anyone off the hook. Paul says that all have sinned and fallen short. Uh, and another verse that I want to go to that shows that, if I'm going fast, just kind of like slow down and I'll try to slow down for y'all, uh, is Isaiah 64, verse 6. And Isaiah 64, 6 says, We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We are all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind. Take us away. And the thing that stands out to me in this verse is, here you have a man of God, someone who speaks on behalf of God. Isaiah is, thus says the Lord. This is someone who speaks for God. But yet he includes himself in this, when he says, we have all become like one who is unclean. So even though he speaks for God, even though he is a prophet, he still includes himself in this race, the human race, as a sinner. He doesn't exclude himself. And all of our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. Um, the youth came tonight, so I won't tell you what that means in the Greek. But it's not good. It's really bad. I mean, you hold it up to God, and you're like, look at my worthless righteous deeds. They mean nothing in the eyes of God. Um, so, what, does it matter that we're sinners? Is it a bad thing? What's so wrong about us being sinners? I mean, um, what does it hurt? I mean, everyone sins, right? Everyone tells a little lie. Well, the fact is that sin separates us from God. That is how sin affects us. If you go all the way back to the beginning, Genesis 3, you have the fall you have Adam and Eve who were perfect. They, I mean, they walked with God. They were in fellowship with God, perfect communion with God. 
And when they sinned, when they ate the fruit, God could not look at them anymore. He could not be in their presence because they have sinned. So because they have sinned, he has to remove himself from that and he has to separate himself from the sin. And that's what sin does to us today. It, ha- it has now separated us from God. We can no longer be in a right relationship or fellowship with God because we sin. Um, another verse is 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. And verse 14 says, The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So not only does sin separate us from God, sin makes us not understand the things of God. So that's when you share the gospel with an atheist or someone who doesn't believe in God. They're like, I don't, it doesn't make sense. I don't get that. Because sin has corrupted them to where they can no longer understand God and what he, what he has done and who he is. So sin separates us from God. Sin makes us not be able to understand the things of God. And then if you go to Ephesians 2.3... Ephesians 2, 3, verse 3 says, Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So sin separates us from God, and sin also makes us children of wrath, where we are deserving of God's wrath because we have sinned against the holy God. So we are born children of wrath. We are born sinners because of what Adam and Eve did. Uh, Romans 5 talks about that. It's either you're in Adam or you're in Christ. And it's kind of the federal headship, it's called. And uh, if you're in Adam, you're dead in your sins. There's nothing you can do that um, will save you from your sins. So we've learned that sin separates us from God. Sin causes us not to be able to understand the things of God. And sin also condemns us and makes us children of wrath. And the thing is, is we deserve God's wrath. As sinners, God is just when he punishes us. God is just for doing that because we have sinned against the holy God. Uh, but it also leaves us hopeless because since we are sinners, there's nothing inside of us that can make us in a right standing with God. So it makes us hopeless. It makes us dead in our sins and trespasses. And it makes us enemies of God. We want nothing to do with God. We are running from God. We hate God when we are sinners. So that's a, I hope, I do those texts and through that, I hope I kind of painted a picture of just how bitter sin is, that it uh, leaves us hopeless. Well, almost, almost leaves us hopeless. If you turn to Romans 5, 8, and it's not anything that we did that gives us hope. And uh, Romans 5, 8, I'm sure most of y'all know this verse. It's probably one of, Two of my uh, favorite verses in the Bible. So Romans 5, 8 says, But God. So while you were a sinner, while you were running from God, while you hated God, while you were an enemy of God, God says, But God showed his love for us and that while we were still sinners, while we hated him, Christ died for us. What? Who does that? Who does that? I don't, I wouldn't die for Hitler. But we're not any better than Hitler. And God sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. That's mind-blowing. That's, that's remarkable. That's amazing. And uh, I think sometimes we read over that. But God. We just, all right, well, let me do my daily reading. But God shows us love. Oh, love's good. That's cool. Um, for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But if but God wasn't in the Bible, if there was no hope, we would still be sinners. If God never decided to intervene and show us mercy and grace, we would be forever condemned in hell. But since we have that but God kind of hinges everything. Yes, we're sinners, but God. And then I'm going to talk about what he's done or uh, how he's done it and allows us to become uh, 
children of God. So, um, let's see. He does it through the gospel. And the gospel basically means the good news. So when you share the gospel, you're sharing with people the good news of Christ. Yes, the gospel is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's telling the story of Jesus Christ and his birth, his uh, life, his death, his resurrection and ascension. But the gospel specifically is the good news of all of that. So uh, Jesus Christ, he was the word. You see that in John. So he's, he's been here from eternity because he's fully God. But yet he came through a virgin birth, so he's fully man. So you have the God man. You have him 100% man, 100% God. He, uh, as he lived and as he walked and as he grew, he followed the law perfectly. I don't follow the law perfectly for a day or a second. I fall short of the law every single day. And Galatians talks about that. Galatians says, outside of Christ, the law condemns you. You try to say, what can I do good? Let me look at the law. And the law says guilty because you can't do anything to do that. That's why Jesus Christ had to follow the law. He had to live a perfect life because your life is not perfect. You do not live a perfect life. And not only did he uh, fully obey God and his will and lived a perfect life, he died on the cross for us. He didn't have to do that. He did not have to die on the cross. And on the cross, he, uh, he took our place. He, it's called substitutionary atonement. That means instead of us paying our debt, he took our place and died our death. And because his death was perfect, he was a propitiation. And that means appeasement. So God can look at him and his death on the cross, and what he's done, and says, satisfied. No more wrath for those who would believe in his work. So he was the perfect sacrifice. His propitiation was sufficient. There's no more wrath for the believers. Uh, he drank all of God's wrath in the garden when he says, let this cup pass from me. That's actually referencing the Old Testament. God's wrath would sometimes be used as a cup, and he would pour out his cup of wrath on nations or people. So when he says, let this cup pass from me, he's saying, let this wrath pass from me. But he drank it. He drank it all at the cross. There's no, I uh, forget which theologian said, he drank it to the last drop. There's nothing left in that cup. Uh, so he died on the cross. He was buried. And three days later, he rose. We do worship a living God, a living Savior. We're not um, Muslims or some other relig uh, false religion that worship falsely. We worship a living God, and he's seated at the right hand of God. And if you repent, repentance is doing the 180. It's seeing how sinful you are, repenting and looking to the cross and looking to God. If you repent of your sins and you believe in Jesus Christ and what he's done on the cross, and you put your trust in him, he will save you. Uh, I forgot to write the verse down, and I apologize, but uh, the verse is, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Um, so go to Romans 8.1, please. And Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemna condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That is amazing because first we were condemned. First we were guilty. And Christ died. He became the propitiation. He satisfied God's wrath that if you repent and you believe in him, then you are no longer condemned. You are no longer guilty in God's eyes. And not only does he not make you condemned, but he makes you a child of his. He makes you a son of God. He makes you a priest. I mean, that's just, it's amazing because you're a sinner you deserve nothing, but yet he gives you everything. And I, I, I love that so much. I'm so thankful for the words, but God. And I meant to read Ephesians 2, but uh, maybe another time. Uh, so how does this affect our, li uh, our lives? What, is, what does this mean for the unbeliever? This, this good news is sin. Uh, not the good news is sin, but uh, the good news uh, so it means for the unbeliever, you stand guilty before a thrice holy God. That outside of Christ, you cannot save yourself. You look to other things to fulfill you, to where only Christ can fulfill that satisfaction. That's why um, greed is rampant, um, lust, 
and all these other things because people find satisfaction in those instead of the God of the universe. Um, and to the unbeliever in here today, I say look to the cross. That's the only place you'll find satisfaction. All these other things are fleeting and they fade away. Yes, in that moment, they might satisfy that desire or that sin. But in the, dis- in the long run, they are killing you and you're on your path to hell. So look to the cross because Romans 5a says, but God, while you were still sinners, died for you. So that's, um, yeah. So believe and repent in what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. But more importantly, what does this mean for us? People who have put their faith in Jesus Christ and repented, what does this news mean for us? It means you are loved. The God of the universe, the God who's created everything, looks upon you and says, I love you. You are a child of mine, and I care for you. And since he has saved you, there's nothing that can take you away from him. The Bible in John says that you are in his hand. I mean, just imagine the God of the universe has you in his hand. He is holding on to you. And you might struggle at times to try to get out. He's like, no, you're mine. And Philippians says that uh, he promises to finish his good work in you. And that good work is salvation. So he saves you. And he says, I promise I will fulfill this and I will bring it to the end. He, he seals us with the Holy Spirit. So not only does he save us, but yet he grows us more and more like Christ. And every day, the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sins and points us to the cross. And he glorifies us, right? So we have justification, sanctification, and then he glorifies us. That's when we die, he brings us into heaven, and he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Um, so the Greek word also for gospel can mean a message of victory. And I personally like that one. I like good news too, but you know, when you're on the mission field or you're sharing the gospel with someone else and you bring that message of victory, that yes, you are a sinner, yes, you are deserving of hell, but God, and then you give them the message of victory. Uh, if you go to, with me to, oh, where is it at? 1 Corinthians 15, 55. Verse 55 says, uh, Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Why does it say, where is your victory? Because death has no victory for believers. Because Christ has defeated death on the cross. Christ has won the victory, and victory is his. Um, So, as Christians, we should hate sin because sin is why Christ died on the cross. That sin that you committed, that little lie you tell, is why Christ went to the cross to die. So you should never take sin lightly. You should hate it. Because uh, Psalms talks about there are seven sins God hates. And if we are to be like God, we must be a people who hate sin, who do not let sin get off without an excuse. So uh, an, an analogy I heard that really convicted me um, for people who might uh, maybe not take the gospel message as important or say, well, you know, we don't really need to share the gospel. That's what missionaries are for. That's why we send Brother Terrell out because he has the gift of sharing the gospel. Uh, and the analogy goes like this. If there's a doctor and he finds the cure for cancer or HIV or any disease, and he just stays in his little room and says, oh, I found the cure but he never goes out and shares it. What would you say about that doctor? What is wrong with you? Go get the cure. Go share with people. And what, how much worse is that for us if we have the cure for eternal life that we just, you know, maybe come to church on Sunday and Wednesday, but we never go out or share the gospel? I mean, if you think the doctor who has that cure is bad, how much worse are we? And I don't try to do that to condemn us or anything, just to uh, wake y'all up, because it really uh, convicted me when I heard that. And we, so we must be a people who hate sin, share the gospel. And the only, we, the only way we can really find out how bad sin is is by reading God's word, right? So we must be a people who read God's word diligently. 
we must be a people of prayer. So we need to pray that God will help us battle sin, that we won't succumb to sin, that he will give us the power to overcome the sin in our lives that we are struggling with. Um, and we people of fellowship, this is good. Getting together with the body of Christ and brothers and sisters in Christ, this is good. This strengthens us. This builds us up. Um, especially if you're really close to someone, you can come to them. Hey, look, I'm struggling with the sin. Can you please help me? Oh, this is about to fall. I need to stop moving. Uh, so fellowship is good. Fellowship is what brings you together. Uh, fellowship ultimately will help you deal with sin. And uh, if I may, I promise I wouldn't talk fast, but it's kind of like a snowball. It just builds up. And after a while, I'm like, oh, it's too late now. So <laughs> uh, I'm on my last page, so... Yeah. <laughs> so um, let me, before I end, I want to just tell a story of a martyr. And uh, this is how we should live our Christian life. And I think his life represents it perfectly. Uh, he was the first Protestant martyr under Mary I. And his name was John Rogers. Now, some of y'all might have heard of him. Um, he worked with William Tyndale to translate the Bible to English. And uh, William Tyndale was martyred by, uh, and so after William Tyndale was martyred, John Rogers was asked to preach a sermon in front of people. And at the time, the Catholic Church was the dominant uh, religion. So he could have preached uh, justification by faith plus works, what the Catholics believe. But yet when he went up there, he knew that he could not teach anything but Scripture. So he taught justification by faith alone, that it's nothing you do that saves you. Well, they didn't like that. They wanted him to teach their doctrines. They wanted him to teach what they believed, but he couldn't go against God's word. So later, uh, some, some accounts say a couple of days later, some say like a month, but he was arrested because of what he preached. And he was thrown in jail for a year. And during that time while he was in jail, uh, he asked if he could see his wife or his bride, and they said no. Uh, he had a newborn baby the whole time while he was doing that. Um, and, I mean, that's the gospel that gets him through that. And there's more. I'm going to finish it. But, I mean, not to be able to see your wife or your newborn baby, there's nothing in us that allows us to have that strength or to have that courage. It's only the grace of God that gives us that strength to be able to persevere. And um, they said when they were bringing him out to be burned, he was singing hymns. What? That's, that's unthinkable. I'd be like, help me. Somebody help me. But no, he sung hymns. And his wife and his kids were cheering him on as he walked to the, uh, the stake to be burned alive. Um, and what really got me is, is he looks to the crowd and he sees his wife his nine kids, and his wife holding their newborn baby. And any other person would have ran and says, I recant. I don't mean what I said about justification by faith alone. Yes, you can have works. Yes, you can do all this. Just let me see my family. But not him. Why? Because God gave him strength. He looked to the gospel. The gospel is what sustained him in this moment. And the gospel was the only thing that sustained him. So yes, he walked by and his kids were cheering their father on. I can't even imagine what they were saying. I don't, I don't know. Um, some people at the scene, the people who were leading him, said it looked like a bride walking to his, uh, their groom, her groom. So here's a man who's walking to his death and it looks like a celebration. Uh, and they said as the fire began to consume him, he washed his hands in the fire like it had no power over him. That's the power of the gospel. That's how we should live, knowing that God has saved us, that God sustains us, and that God promises to finish that work. That if he can do that, if he can pass his children and look to Christ and keep his eyes focused on Christ, that's how we should live. We should keep our eyes on Christ. We should keep our eyes on God. So we should never be a people that take the gospel lightly. We should wake up and appreciate the gospel. We should be thankful for the gospel. The gospel should be in every part we do. The gospel should be everything for us. Um, 
because it is good news, it's great news, it's the message of victory. Um, that was a little quick, I'm sorry, I apologize. <laughs> uh, so I guess I'll close in prayer, is that what usually happens here? Um, but yeah, I, I usually would give a warning that there's two things that usually happens. One, I sweat a lot. And two, uh, I talk really fast. And I was going to mention a third one. I was surprised to see Mr. Jace here because I seen on uh, Facebook, Chick-fil-A had free ice cream from 6 to 7. <laughs> and if you know anything about Mr. Jace, he is a man of God and he's a man of Chick-fil-A. So I did not think I was going to see him here today. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah <laughs> uh, but yeah thank y'all for letting me have the opportunity to speak here and just give y'all what God has laid on my heart <laughs>